Um, welcome to the GNU C Library BOF. Uh, my name is Carlos O'Donnell. I am one of the project stewards. Uh, I actually think there's five project stewards who are here for the, for the project, so that might be the most number of uh, you know, stewards that we've had for the project in any cauldron. Um, so if you want to ask any hard-hitting questions, please go ahead and let us know. The BOF is for you guys that are here to be able to ask questions, uh, talk as a community, determine uh, issues that we have, things that we need to fix. Uh, I've got a couple of slides here, but mostly I think uh, I want to take people's questions for the upcoming two development cycles, uh, what we want to get done, what we want to get accomplished. So um, are we okay to start? Yeah. Okay. Can you see library buff? Um, the first thing I want to do is celebrate our successes. Um, every time we come back to the GNU cauldron, we're often kind of downtrodden and you go out and you drink beer and you complain about the unwinder and we complain about the state of malloc and we complain that we have no NUMA awareness. We complain that PPC 64LE hasn't transitioned to the new float 128 type yet. And so like, <laughs> it, it, you know, it, it's important to remember that we've made progress on things that year after year we're having time box releases, we're hitting a number of bugs, you know, we, we consistently have uh, user visible changes as bugs, um, there's new Unicode stuff, we've had new interfaces, uh, you know, con we're consistently deprecating now old interfaces that we said we'd get rid of because they were bad, we've improved security in a couple of aspects, and so I want everybody to take left or right hand and just go like this, right? Pat yourself on the back. So uh, we've, done a, <laughs> we've done a lot of stuff that, that is good. Um, so, you know, that makes me really happy as a steward. It makes me happy to see people working together. It makes me happy to see people talking about stuff and moving forward. It actually makes me really happy to see people having harder discussions about, like, well, what if we don't agree? What if we don't agree about this interface? How do we resolve that disagreement? Because if we didn't have disagreement, it means we probably didn't have enough contributors involved in a, in a given discussion uh, trying to get to a point where an interface is either optimal or it represents all the semantics that are required by the underlying hardware. And the fact is there's a lot of pieces of hardware that we're trying to support. Uh, Joseph, do you know how many ABIs we have at this point? Like 50 or something, if you count all the permutations? Yeah, there's like 50 ABIs. And so, uh, you know, I mean, like, consistent use of build many glibcs in the community has been really nice um, at, in that, you know, at this point, if you have a problem with something, you just hit the, hit the build button on build many glibcs and out cranks the script, which builds all of the 50 ABI permutations and, and tries to at least cross compile all of them so that you've got a, a consistent set of, of results there. Um, so that makes me happy. So BOF notes, um, anything that we try to take here, if Florian takes notes, we'll try to put them online on the, on the wiki. So, and also, if you have right, to the, right access to the wiki, go in there and add your own notes. Feel free to add whatever you want. Um, so now we come to the point, what do you want to talk about? Um, I have a couple other slides after this, but anyway. Um, so Sidesh raised the point that he had me put on here that he wanted to talk about the future of the bench tests. For those of you that don't know, uh, glibc has a micro benchmark suite. The micro benchmark suite is used for discussions, uh, objective discussions about uh, performance changing patches. And there's, you know, there's always quite a, quite a uh, heated discussion over what's a real workload, what's a representative micro benchmark, uh, how do you interpret it, how much expert opinion is required. So, um, Sidesh, do you want to ask whatever question you have for what's going to happen with the micro benchmarks? Sure. Okay. I'll, I'll probably give a brief. You're, you're unamplified, so you have to speak loud. Ouch. Okay. Yeah. The microphone only gives the recording to the, to, to the okay. eventual recording. So the, the brief uh, background that I would give over here about bench tests is that uh, we started with math. And we put a lot of dummy data for math uh, just to kind of uh, get things going, get the framework started, and so on. And we also added a bunch of string benchmarks that were, again, completely crappy. And I, I got a lot of flack for that. Uh, but then the point was to get that framework going, 
right? Uh, over the past couple of years, uh, I have been working on string functions. Uh, Wilco has been doing a lot of work in that area as well. And what we've done is, we, wherever we have touched things, we, we've tried to introduce new benchmarks, new micro benchmarks that are relevant. So uh, what I want to know is if if anyone else is working in other areas, like I know, uh, I know the ARM folks are working on math. Uh, then there's malloc uh, work that is going on. Whether there are any workloads that you can actually contribute uh, to the micro benchmark, and if we can actually get some sort of traction going over there, because right now, uh, the other thing that happened, uh, I think it was early this year or, or late last year, is that uh, the micro benchmark also got picked up by the open benchmarking project, and now they're reporting uh, results over there on what I would say is a 50-50 benchmark suite. So we need we, we kind of owe something to them as well in, in terms of benchmark accuracy. And just dropping benchmarks isn't the answer over there. So I, I wanted to hear if there are any ideas in, in, in with respect to specific benchmarks that we could, we could take forward from here. So are you talking about, so you're asking, is anybody working on other benchmarks for work that they're working on? Oh, so the first question is, are you doing any performance optimization work, right? And how do we use the benchmarks uh, to get that optimization work so that we make sure that the benchmarks also get updated to reflect that work? Um, I'm not doing that, but is there a way for people who are doing it to contact you and say, here's a benchmark? How do they do that? On Libc Alpha, I'm, I'm, I'm reading practically every email there. <laughs> Yeah, and, and Nick, the, the micro benchmarks are relatively straightforward. There's a little bit of like JSON boilerplate to start up like the reporting portion of the benchmark. But I mean, it does require expert knowledge to say, well, do I have to do a bit of a warm up? You know, what am I actually testing? How do you test it? Is it threaded? Is it not threaded? So um, the threaded micro benchmarks are, are hard. And so are the, the malloc micro benchmarks are also hard and very workload dependent. Uh, in fact, the, some of the malloc micro benchmarks that we use with the, with the system simulator for the malloc trace simulator, they aren't in glibc's micro benchmark. So their data sets are too big. Um, so is anybody ha doing anything performance related then with uh, micro benchmarks? No? With, with glibc, basically. Yeah. Florian, do you have any plans to add uh, unwinder tests to the micro benchmark to attempt to get data out of it? To like, like really, like add a, add a, add, add in, indicative tests in the micro benchmark to show the speed of the unwinder from glibc, like cancel, thread cancellation micro benchmark. Probably not thread cancellation, but unwinding performance we could test. The, the problem there is uh, it's sort of hard to, com to, to, to compile representative code. So that can be a bit challenging from time to time. Well, if you can't compile representative code, then the code that you would want to include would be kind of like uh, boundary cases. So yeah, like yeah. worst case and so best case. And so you put both of them into the into I'm not the sure what I'm doing wrong, but for <laughs> my synthetic, synthetic test cases, um, GCC has really bad performance when compiling them. Maybe it does some sort of, uh, it, it, it attempts to do a lot of tail merging between functions or something like that. I don't know. So, <laughs> that, okay. that, that, uh, sure, I could polish the stuff I have and, and submit it, but yeah, that would be probably a good thing once we, we have a clear view of how, how of the problem. Move, the, yeah. uh, move that forward. Okay. Um, I, the, only thing other, the only other thing that we're looking at is malloc RSS reduction. And so we could probably add micro benchmarks that measure average RSS usage. And that would be interesting because you, would, you could be able to track with the micro benchmarks, well, how is RSS over time in terms of the runtime usage, right? If you had micro benchmarks that were targeted at measuring RSS usage for a given set of functions. We've never had that, right? We've never had the case where you can run, run some number of printfs with some number of string formats and see how much RSS that consumes and then track it release to release. Um, does anybody here from GCC know, like are you still tracking uh, compiler memory consumption for given input files to determine how much memory the compiler consumes? 
<laughs> so for the record, the answer is sometimes a little. <laughs> OK. Yeah, because I know there are, like, like, I think the TG Math stuff, Joseph, it's like it consumes a lot of memory when you're compiling. And, and, and even then, before we split up the test cases, some of the tests were very big and took a lot of memory to compile. So. Do you see as options to display how much memory it's used? Uh, and it is used if we have a bug report that it's using way too much memory and have anything, but we're not tracking it all the time. Yeah, that's right. OK, yeah. so no tracking. OK. TG Math should use a lot less memory if you're using GCC8 and the latest Unibs. Since I put in, well, built-in built function, actually, special built-in TG Math syntax that avoids expanding the arguments of the TG Math macros more than once and so avoids the exponential blow up. OK. All right. So I mean, that, Sudesh, that's another thing. Um, anyone else with any other benchmark stuff that they might be uh, looking at to include? No? So I guess uh, a follow-up question is, should we gate? Uh, so the follow-up question is, should we gate performance patches on microbenchmarks, and how hard should we gate them? So right now, it's more like, hey, it would be nice if you give us a benchmark. Uh, contributed to the bench test, uh, should we be a little more, well, for a lack of a better word, militant about it? I think it is probably overly prescriptive to, to require it. But I think that the, the senior reviewers are pretty hard on you if you show up. At like the, So the, to give you an example, the malloc changes to do the, to do the mitigation one byte overflows DJ ran the simulator with the workloads we had to try to figure out if there was even a measurable performance difference with those things in place, and there wasn't. And then that informs the reviewer. I'd like to leave it in the hands of the reviewer to judge whether or not they agree with what's being posted, because some things are incredibly difficult to measure, right? And you know, we, we don't need to be so prescriptive. We just we, the the, se the senior reviewers in the project just need to keep in mind that one of the checkboxes you have in your mental list is, did we get a micro benchmark? Is it possible to even make one? Could you show a difference, right? Um, that's, that would be my input, but Florian. Um, I tend to agree, and there's some cases where it's kind of obvious there is a performance improvement. If, for, for, exa for example, if you remove a lock yeah. by making data thread local or something like that, then you can show an arbitrary amount of performance improvement just by cranking up the number of threads so that yeah. it's not actually useful. It might be more useful if there could be a case where uh, you say, OK, we see a performance improvement in the four-thread th uh, four case, but the standard single-threaded case, uh, case would going to suffer a little bit or something like that. Yeah. Then then it's more complex, I should, should say. but then we actually need to look at benchmarks. But this still might not be something we can distill into micro benchmark. We That's need to right. look yeah. at yeah. Uh, real workloads out there. Yeah, it, it's even very hard to go between the cases of, I took a lock out, but I had to put three atomic operations in to get rid of the lock. And so then we've discussed this in terms of malloc, in which case, like, Sure, you got rid of an arena lock, but then now you've got two atomic operations. And the original lock originally was only a user space atomic operation with the probability of a fallback to a syscall. So what's worse, a one atomic op and a probable syscall, or three atomic ops that always happen, right? And so the, the, balance, the on balance there is difficult to judge without understanding perhaps what the corpus of test case would be. So, and again, it, it's expert opinion, I think, in that case. Um, so was that, was that it for you, Sadesh? OK. Um, I, so as, as we continue on like discussion, just posting these up, just reminders. Uh, Sadesh, have you volunteered for, for release management? OK. So Sadesh has volunteered for release manager for 2.29 and 2.30, I think. <laughs> um, but you've done, you've done so, yeah, you've done so with, with intent. And I think that goes to, I know we talk about this every year. Remember, the first slide was, right? Um, so changelog automation. And uh, what I tried to distill here is, the, Sadesh, get, correct me if I'm wrong, but the goals were 
simplifying patch submission, right? Because change logs are hard to write. Well, perfect GNU formatted change logs are hard, if not another language. Yeah, I, I speak English and change log, right? Like, um, so simplify review, making it direct and easy to review. So that when someone sends you a git amable patch, you've got the change log, you've got the commit message, and the only thing that you are ever going to modify if you're a committer is any reviewed by additions that you want to make, which would track consensus. So if someone says to you, well, I wasn't involved in the discussion, well, you say, that's okay, well, you weren't there, but all these other people did, did provide review. Um, so part two of change log automation is that uh, there was an on-list discussion in which this branched into two different directions, if I understood correctly. One of them was uh, decoupling the change log from the patch itself so that when you cherry pick, you get the change log portion and the news portion that you can just tack on to the, effectively the top of what is the running file. Um, and then there was the, the discussion that Joseph raised, which was not just doing that, but this is the, the, the next step, which is the automation of the change log. Did I, did I understand the split of the conversation correctly? So it's, it's actually an either or. Yeah. As in the the first point was the suggestion that I made. Yeah. Uh, which is that we decouple the change log, put it in the commit log, and then we forget about it. Yeah. Uh, that just gets carried on to whichever branch that we backport to. Uh, what Joseph suggested was that instead of doing that, just write a script that generates a change log message, which is minimal. It just supports detecting entities, and once we do that, we can drop the change log altogether. And I, I like the idea of dropping the change log altogether, which is the reason why I'm going to try two. If I'm not able to do two, I'll probably attempt one. Yeah. So to explain where two came from. So the basic thing is the change log format came from before public version control, and in particular from before public change set oriented version control. So people had a tarball and they wanted to try and figure out where code came from. So that's where the idea of the change log saying what's changed so that it's a conceptual undo list for the code came from. And nowadays when you've got Git, the point is you if people are looking at the code, if people want to know where the code came from, they can look at the individual change sets. And therefore it seems most natural to me, to most people working with Git, that the change log should have the change log is a description of the change that you are looking at at the same time as the log entry. And so it should have the higher level information that's not obvious from the change. Just like the comments in the code don't need to repeat the obvious semantics for the C. You don't need to put a comment add one to I. You have to have the comments that say what's happening at a higher level while you're doing it and so on. And so it's that to of commit messages similarly not to repeat what you can see when you're looking at the commit at the same time as the message but to have the higher level information. So because of this, so maybe about a year ago on the bug standards mailing list, I raised the point that given appropriate conditions can, about having public change set oriented version control and so on, it should no longer be necessary to use this particular change log format. Now, the difficulty there is the only way you can get a non-trivial change into the GNU coding standards is if you convince RMS. And RMS is not particularly familiar with modern development practices using Git. And since the, basically the way you learn the alternatives to looking at a change log is through actually developing with Git and using these methods in practice, OK, I've got this bug. I need to now use the Git tools to investigate how something changed. It's very hard when RMS isn't interested in actually taking bugs and investigating them and using these different tools to explain, to do things by entirely explaining things to him, this is how you do things, when in practice this is something active, it's not something you learn by explanations, it's something you learn by doing. So RMS has got fixated on the idea 
that the key thing that you need to be able to get from logs is a list of the named entities that changed in a different commit. To my mind, actually, if you're using that in a change log, it's a means to an end of finding out when a particular entity changed. If you think there's a problem in that entity, you want to know where it changed, and you can do this with things like git log dash capital L or git blame or things like that. But our best one it seems to be insistent on wanting to be able to solve the inverse problem, given a commit, find out what named entity changed there. And if you can do that, he thinks it would be fine to stop requiring the particular change log format that involves giving a description of what changed in every named entity. So if we can produce a sufficiently good script that will list the entities that named in a commit, then RMS seems open to a change to the GNU coding standards that would allow stopping using the change log format. So then we could write commit messages more, well, we could write commit messages more like Linux kernel ones, basically like what we already do other than the change log entry, describe the change at the appropriate level for someone reading the change to understand it. Maybe you do sometimes talk about the details of how something was changed, maybe you don't, depending on what seems actually useful at the human level for that particular change. Yeah, so, so just to get your, to clarify your point there, if, if we went to just describing the entities that changed in a change log, RMS accepts it, the GNU coding standard has changed, and then glibc switches to it, we would then have, and I think you've mentioned this before, a sync script that you run at release boundaries to update the change log, and it parses every commit, looks at what changed, updates the change log, and then it gets pushed out just like how news has its bug entries updated today. Yes, it might not even need to do it in anything like new change log form, but RMS does want some sort of thing in the release tables for the benefit of people using those without internet access for the version control repository. But the thing is, basically, it's like maybe a 10 line script that just puts a copy of the git logs since the past release in a change log file. So that's something very simple and low maintenance if we can stop requiring people for every commit to write things in the GNU change log format. Okay. So the, uh, uh, the good thing about change logs, for GCC at least, right, and I don't know glibc so very well, is uh, uh, it, forces, it forces a submitter to describe every change he made. And uh, uh, if you don't have that in change logs anymore, where will you have it? You will not have it in commit messages. Because people do not write good, uh, good messages. It's what? Yeah, how, how, how are you going to force them to? Part of the, if we change this. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, you've, yeah. Uh, uh, you've got to review it. Uh, yes. What does a reviewer get to see? Not just the pets, because just the pets is bullshit. It's so sorry for uh, We'd say what people post has to include the whole of what would be the commit message, and the whole yeah. of that would have to be reviewed. Because yes, you do lose the point where someone has to read through the whole patch in detail. Right. Reviewers do need to be a little more careful, and they do need to be careful about picking up on points in your commit message. This thing is not adequately explained, and so on. I, I yeah. think we should keep requiring committers to write change how many people think we should, sorry, so number one, how many people think we should keep requiring people to write change log entries as they do today? The same format. Same format, exactly as they do today. How many people think they should be pulled out of git commit messages? Oh. Any commit messages. Well, what you're saying like uh, uh, you write it, but you write it into the git commit message and it gets sucked out of there? I'm saying you write something in the git commit message and it gets sucked out of there. Just no, I, I don't think, I think this should be just automated, but or is that going to be your next question? How many people think it should be just automatically generated from the git commit, the diff of the commit, and then placed into a change log for eventually distribution, right? What, what does that even mean? You, you mean you want some script that has some artificial intelligence or something so it knows what patches mean and you can put it in a whatever change thingy? So the thing is that what we're, what the discussion is that semantically your git commit message which has a detailed description of what you changed yeah. plus the diff 
Well, Both of those say, things it, could provide the information that we have today, which is in the, the manually written change sure. log of a, of a very specific format, sure. right? Plus some, plus some information. Both of those things are equivalent. The, the question is, is you know, the, the goal, if you remember the goal in the previous slide, is to make this process easier, yes. right? Yes. So, yeah. Fifty-fifty, basically. For the, no one wants to keep writing change logs. Then there's a fifty-fifty split between extracting it from the commit message or auto-generating it and dumping it. Sure. Can you say it into the microphone so people record the? Uh, we could we could uh, just dump. For each release, we rele release the release tarball and another tarball with the 500 odd patches in them in patch form generated from Git because we never do any merges. So the patches could be trivially generated and so replicate the. Uh, he's, he's been waiting for a while. We could get yeah. in. Okay. A Git format patch. Uh, 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 Git yeah. is completely yeah. useless when you f want to find out where your code went to. Uh, you want to know when something ha has been deleted, when something was moved somewhere, when it was renamed or merged with something, yes, and Skype, git log. Skype Skype I haven't found anything in bin utils where the code went. So, so if, if you do a git log or git show minus minus that, it tell you exactly what changed bit by bit. Yeah. Yeah. So if I want to know what is essentially going to do the change log. So what we're essentially going to do with the changelog generation is uh, look at all those Git objects and figure out which function that that change went in and just say that this entity was modified in this hunk, this entity was added or removed. That actually so it's, doesn't it's really work. Uh, nothing more not than even that. With hard AI, can you do that? Um, you don't. You don't you really need, need AI for that. Identify so what, is, um, what an entity is. You have functions, but sometimes you have also something else, like enum numbers or some auto-generated text. And uh, worse, you can't find out uh, what actually happened to this object. Was it moved? Was it merged? Yeah. It doesn't need to be perfect at identifying the entities. It just needs to be good enough that mistakes are sufficiently there that RMS does not consider them problematic. Mm -hmm. And in any case, a lot of the difficult cases are cases where the existing changelog format is pretty useless because what's changing is not a function. It's, say, a GNU make file rule for which the name for which the thing on the left-hand side of the rule takes up a whole line of the changelog file and involves calling various GNU make functions. And in that case, since you can't write a very useful name for the entity in a changelog entity anyway, it doesn't really matter if the script identifying entities doesn't make very much useful of it either. Yeah, so some of the knowledge, and I know what you're getting at, that is in the changelog that we've grown to be accustomed to. We just have to move it and describe it. You can, you, like, if you really want to, you can still write a changelog entry in your commit message and, and use its, its structure to describe the change. But the commit message now needs to become a little more verbose. You need to explain, well, I moved this to here, and I refactored from x to y. And then, then your, that's your commit message. And then the auto-generated changelog, which meets the GNU project's requirements, is going to be simpler. You're going to lose some data there. That data moves into the commit message in a more uh, both English or explanatory fashion where you describe what it is you've moved where and why. And you might even have the ability to describe it in, in as much time as you want. So in, in GLIPC, we're basically, in, in we basically trying our best to uh, review the, the git commit logs as well. So if you take the change log out of the picture, the commit log is essentially non -ex non-existent, and I'm hoping that that will force reviewers to make sure that there is something in there that actually describes the change, and uh, it's not something on the lines of "oh, look at the patch." It's evident that's that's no longer going to be sufficient. 
but once we're no longer bound by the change log format, you can judge for each patch what the appropriate level to describe it at is. Yes. The change log format forces things to be described always in terms of the named files and named entities they're in, and what changed in each one of them. And some patches, that may be a useful way of giving an overall explanation. And for some patches, that is not a good level for understanding them. Just like when you're commenting on code, you can judge for each particular piece of code how much it needs comments, what level the comments should describe it, and so on. The commit messages are basically comments for the commits, the same way as code comments are comments for the code. You take it together with the commit, you describe it at the level that is appropriate, in that particular case, in your judgment. And then if your reviewers disagree, they can ask for something to be explained more, just like the reviewers sometimes ask for more comments to be added to something. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So I just want to say that in the GDP project, we already use quite verbose commit messages. And it happens often that if I any maintainer looks at a patch and I don't understand why you're doing this change, can you explain it more? And then the person explains and then we ask, well, please add that to the comment message. And um, in the comment message you explain, so what change and why, at least that's what I do. I move this function to this file because I think it belongs there. And in the change log, we're prevented from writing a why. So I feel like there's more information in the commit message and so often I write what and why and in the change log I just repeat the what. So that's the part that I... But yeah, but yeah I, I agree that if uh, I think in GCC, the, the standard is to not write commit message at all or not informative, then of course you're losing something if you remember things like But moving to better commit messages, I think is... Can pass it, but I think somebody so. else wanted to... I've been using verbose sort of commit messages in GCC as well as GLibc for the past few years. Yeah. Yeah, I think you just have to establish the culture up front if you're going to make this kind of a change that the 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 first thing that you do is reject the patch right away on the basis of the commit log and start getting in the habit of that. You look at the commit log, yeah. it's, it's, it's but, not good but, enough, I'm yeah. not going to and, review and it, because otherwise of, you're just wasting people's time. Yeah. yeah. So, so much of that has to do now with uh, updating the contribution checklist for glibc and getting to the point where we say what you should be submitting is the git amable patch right, that's got everything changed in it so that you can both review the commit message, the the, the like the change log wouldn't exist anymore because it's going to be auto-generated, but the news entry is going to exist. The bug, bug entries aren't in, in there anymore because we auto-generate the bug list. But then the git amable format is everything that you are going to get judged on for the patch, right? And so, you know, that would, I think going to that would be really good. And, and I, that brings up the, this kind of point here, documenting consensus. I said, so last year we, we agreed that, you know, we'll start trying to do signed off by, reviewed by, because um, it, you know, it's hard to track sometimes who was involved in the process, uh, who signed off on it, who did the reviews. And I think from 0%, in one year we've gone 0% to 5% uh, you know, signed off by as people signing off on their work, and 7% uh, reviewed by as people giving their review saying, yeah, that, that looked good to me, blah, 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 you know, I did the review. Um, so, Pat on the back, it's, it's up. I think next year we'll look at this again and we'll see, you know, um, did we do a better job of documenting who reviewed what so that we can come back maybe and also uh, help people understand the changes. Um, so what are we stuck on right now? Is it just deciding? So Florian wants a microphone. DJ, can you help? Oh, sure. Or just hand it. So uh, I don't think... Does anyone else? Sorry. No, I just wanted to, uh, okay. I have two comments regarding the change logs. Okay. Jose, you've been waiting, so we'll, I'll have you comment first, and then I'll have Florian comment. Okay. The first one is that if it turns out that we can automate, right, the creation, the generation of, I mean, if it turns out that most of the information that we are putting today in change logs can be inferred automatically, then what is the value of that information at the end of the day? I mean... I would turn it, you know, the other way well, around. I mean, there's, there's offline issues, right? When you're disconnected and you have the, the dist tarball and the data, the question is that that off, I offline. I know, but it's yeah. about what kind of information we have been putting in those files, you know, in the last, I don't know, 20 years. If it turns out that most of that information 
It's just a relation of new variable, new function, uh, function renamed to this, or extract, move to this file, to this other file. And if it turns out that can, that can be automated, then my question is, what is the value of that information after all? You know what I mean? Yeah, but, but so this is the, the, there's this, the two comments here about artificial intelligence is there is some value in a bit of the semantics of the change log and what it documents that's harder to see, but yeah. there's not much. I yeah, I, I, w I have been always a proponent of change log files, but they changed yeah. my, my, my mind, you know, in the last few years. Yeah. And the second comment is that I have seen projects where they say, okay, let's put the change log, you know, in the commit message. And then at the end of the day, I have seen a, a tendency of the developers say, okay, I will not write any explanation of what the change is about because hey, you have the, the change log entry there. It's like in GCC. In GCC, if you do a <laughs> git log, you know, okay, you see that there is a new variable here, a new function here, but what is the change about anyway? Yeah. Right? So I am also against putting the change log entries in the commit messages because that makes people to actually not explain what the change is about because, hey, you have the change log file, that's the change log entry. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I allow Florian to make his comment, please. Yeah. Um, Florian. So, one thing that brings value. Here in terms of uh, generating uh, the, the uh, diff information mechanically up front is that it's easier to search and much more efficient. So what I'm doing from time to time, I look at posted patches on mailing lists instead of git history because the mailing list contents is indexed and therefore easy to search. And for git history, I would still have to compute all the patches. And that is more difficult to search than and less efficient for purely from a mechanically uh, performance perspective. So, but there are other ways to achieve that. You, you, you could just uh, pre-compute all the patches and put them into a table or something like that. Um. Uh, let me preface this by saying I haven't looked to see if this documentation exists, but um, since I, I do GCC patches, I still do them in Subversion versus Git, even though they have the, the Git tool, because my Git knowledge is still fairly basic. So for instance, I, could, I couldn't tell you how to add a, a Git reviewed by uh, key to a, a patch. You um, type it in. Hmm? You type it in. <laughs> yeah, you type it in. <laughs> the, the person who's making the commit, there. they they will add the lines, ah, and at, well, and what happens is as the email goes round, the patch gets updated, and the as, as people sign off on it, that the list of lines grows, and then eventually what gets committed is that is the in the commit message with the patch that okay, goes and in, and that is just part of the email that's going around, yeah, not is, something that exactly. And as the email goes around, people start adding their oh, I signed off on it, I signed off on it, I signed off on it, and if there's a new version then you, some, many times you have to throw away all those and get everybody to review it again because it's different. So I mean, if I review somebody's patch, am I sending a reply where I've added that or I'm just telling them I reviewed it and they'll add it? You reply to their patch, you say, uh, you know, reviewed by your name, email, and you say, this looks good to me, it, and, okay. and it answers all my questions and the, the code looks good, and then, and then when they commit, their, their commit message will be their commit message, which got reviewed, plus their signed off buys because they wrote it, plus your reviewed buys because you reviewed it. And so then the, the historical record is there that you did the review right. and that was the commit message. Okay. So some of the stuff about the actual process being documented I think would help also. So like you were talking, I think you were talking. Sure, there's a contribution checklist. And so for glibc, the contribution checklist is a, is a document that documents how right. the process works. So that would need to be updated if, if we yeah. pulled the trigger on making this yeah. formal. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I think your machine's died. Did I run out of power? <laughs> well, oh yeah. Probably. You talk sober now. <laughs> <laughs> Almost, yeah, out of power. So one of the things is, I think when you compare glibc with gcc, you'll probably find a much lower interaction between the modules being changed. And that may make things like change logs less valuable. One of the things I find when reviewing GCC patches is that they often cross multiple files 
and there's lots of new variables come in and sometimes the submitter listing everything that they, they're putting in there helps to clarify why it's there. And it also makes them think about why they've put that variable in. So there has been... It's one of the few things that I do think, you know, sometimes making the submitter of the patch think about what they're submitting helps. So th that has been the constantly touted argument for change logs. And I used to believe that until we switched to more detailed commit logs. And at that point, I realized that I, I'm just going to make you describe verbally in any format you want, which can also be a change log, a semi-structured change log format in the commit message. And that's really what's of value. I agree. Uh, but so I what think, you're saying is I think writing, you're balanced, right? you're, writing what the commit. I'm just saying is it's the final thing that the submitter does. They go through and they identify all the bits that I've just added to this thing. And they say, is that really part of this patch? Should I be sending that up as part of this? Or should it have been separated out or even thrown away because it's now a dead part of an earlier revision? Yeah. Or, or they and don't do it because yeah. they auto-generate it. Like, I know David Malcolm, who's not here, when he generates his massive patch sets, I'm pretty sure his change logs are generated by scripts. Because for the hu large refactoring processes, you just can't look at everything. Yeah, so. I understand that. Yeah. And that's why you end up with, script with change logs with wildcards and things in them. <laughs> and, I mean, it was the other process was that, you know, you, you change an API. Yeah. And in GCC, you used to just write, all, all callers changed. Yeah. Right? No. Because it would have taken forever to list every single yeah. caller, yes. and it gave no value. Yeah. So your, your point is well taken, that there was a, like an orthogonal, the, the, the orthogonality of it was that there was value in reviewing and writing the change log because it forced you to do an, a personal, like, internal self-review of, oh, like, could I have done this better? I touched 55 files? Like, oh, God. Like, I don't want to write the change log entry for this. Is there any way I can refactor this differently? But notice that actually, like, sometimes the, it, 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 it impacts how you refactor things because you don't want to write the change log for it. So, um, and that had value. But this, I, I firmly believe that it also had the, its detractors, which is it complicates the process of submitting oh, patches. Agreed. And don't get me wrong, I don't particularly like change Yeah, logs. but so if we... I just think yeah. there are some things where actually that step gave some value. Yeah. The, so when we migrate to detailed commit messages, the value, unfortunately, now has to be upheld by the reviewer. The reviewer has to say, you have not properly explained this change at all. Come back again. This change log message needs to be three or four times as long for you to make sense of what you've actually done here in, in some way, right? I, I like yeah. to remind people when they're submitting a patch to read it before they submit it because it might not be what they think. Yeah, for sure. I just, I have something to discuss that has nothing to do with change logs, so I just want to get yes. in the queue. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think we have to gong the, the change log discussion, but Sadesh is committed to trying to help. Can, can I ask a, a, yeah. a, an ignorant question? Please. Is there a way to get from a committed commit message back to the email thread discussion about it? <sighs> yes, you should be using Garrett. <laughs> yeah. No, you can. So. So for example, we have patchwork. Patchwork tracks the list. And in theory, you can look at the commit message and try to work back through patchwork to find the thing that got committed. But um, it's not all easy. So the, the sad thing is that both our mailing list archive and patchwork split up threads. So yes, yeah. So it's answer. super annoying, the, the per month thread splits. So you, you, like, if you had a three month long discussion about something and you committed it, you now need three separate entries into the split patch. But I try to include a URL reference to the start of the discussion, and then that way people can read yeah, through it. That would be a good practice. Yeah. So think, uh, Sorry. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah, so uh, Joseph, and then I'm going to stop the change log discussion. Uh, Yes, I, we can't keep going. And then I'm going to ask Ian to make his comment. Actually, I'd like to move on from the JSOC discussion to discuss requiring Python for building GLMC. Awesome, that's on the list. 
So okay, yeah. Do people like the idea of requiring Python to build Ulibc? And if that's so, moving away from Perl and Dork scripts and requiring Python, and if they do, are people happy with, as Zach suggested, saying right now we're going to require Python 3.4 or later, so not needing to support Python 2, or for that matter, 3.2, 3.3, in any Python scripts with Ulibc? So, um, I think, Carlos, you probably have more information on this. Uh, a minimal build route, is there any other package that requires awk? Because if it doesn't, then we can just migrate all awk scripts to Python and then replace awk with Python. GCC still requires awk. Yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah. But then that's, that's not part of I don't think, you'll, part of the I don't think you'll get rid of it. No. It's, it's part of the bootstrap, but it's not part of the minimal image, is it? GCC is not part of a minimal image. But you image. wouldn't require it for glibc either, because once glibc is built, it goes into a, a, a build route, and then there's no, the awk wouldn't be in there if it wasn't required by anything. So it I can't answer that question. I have scripts to generate um, the, the closed loop dependency for the build routes and the, and the uh, installable routes and things like that. But I, awk is like always on it. Perl is, in theory, always me. on it, too. It wouldn't surprise me if things like autoconfig generated configure scripts always require more from all I know. Yeah. I don't know if they do, yeah. but it's not okay, so the Okay, so to the broad question in the audience, um, raise your hand if you would object to Python 3 being a added requirement to build glibc in any distros <laughs> that you have. <laughs> Yeah. I would have to patch it out somehow. <laughs> I mean, you're not going to be able to because if we start converting I, I scripts. I want to keep the build environment like as small as possible. So yeah, this is as small so as possible. It doesn't mean that I have to any. It's a huge thing compared to. So let's back up for a second. Python. The 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 actual the actual statement on the list is. Python minimal, which is Python with a few number of import modules, right? So, yeah, it's it's specified. It's not all of Python and the ridiculous explosion. Like it's like we're not supporting all of Perl. You don't need all of Perl to build glibc and the entire CPAN archive and things like that. You need Python and you need a couple of the like a handful of the the core imports you're allowed to import and that's it that's all we would need uh, if you look at the closure of this mi minimal python yeah. it's still quite big i think so why is it so what i'd what like to suggest hear from is maybe uh, make this uh, like not not really optional but m make it possible to build a subset of gnu libc without this uh, no. Could it be possible? No. But the thing is, since people generally in the GLMC developers are much more comfortable with Python than with Org, we'd probably want to replace things like the scripts that generate the symbol version maps and such like. Yes, so please. So because there are these core build scripts in Org that people would be much happier maintaining in Python, you're not, once we start replacing those rather than just say the Perl scripts yeah. building the manual, yeah. you won't be able to build glibc at so, all without So before we continue, I want to ask Dimitri one question. Um, what, is the, what is your worry? What I want to understand is what's your worry about Python 3 in the, in the, build, in the, in, in the build process? What, what are you worried about in that It in that makes our build environment bigger than it is now. And I don't want this. So, but bigger than it is now it is, a, is just a, a fact of the build environment. What's the worry? What happens? Uh, bootstrap. But again, that's just a consequence. It gets bigger. What happens? Uh, it makes bootstrap harder. It uh, makes bootstrap take longer. Not just it? longer, but uh, the more elements is there, it harder it is to maintain. I mean, it breaks. in. In every part, you know. And sure, yeah. There's, a, there's an, extra, an extra thing has been and added. When you port it to a new architecture, it's like every part is, is a nightmare. <laughs> so for the full build, before you can natively build it, yeah, you'd need, you'd yeah. need Python. But OK. You'd also have needed Perl, and you'd also have needed SED, and awk, and core utils, can and everything I else. Please so. speak here? Yes. 
Because that is exactly missing the point. The point is, I completely agree that Python is a really nice language to use if it already exists and would clean up a lot of things and that people don't know awk and Perl as well. But what I believe that you continually are missing here is that Python is much more difficult to bootstrap for a new architecture. The bootstrap, if it already exists, if you already have it, yes, it'll make things a lot easier. Perl and awk have much, much, much near zero requirements to be able to build the initial Perl interpreter. At least historically it has been. I mean, I, I had this argument on the GCC mailing list, and um, if you try to, to bootstrap a new architecture, the biggest uh, challenge is to, to bootstrap Perl on a new architecture. It's not Python. Python is as simple to cross build as, as anything else. So if you want to make the bootstrap easier, replace Perl completely and just rely on Python. So there's the elephant in the room as well, of course. Uh, Python isn't GPL. So do we want to have that as a dependency of glibc, which is like fundamental fundamental thing for the GNU project. I can't hear you, sorry. So uh, a restricted Python front end for GCC, would that solve the problem? I don't know. Uh, and I'm not part of, uh, what's it called, GNU, the big FSF thing, whatever. Yeah. But I don't think it's a good idea for GPL projects to even be able to build them to depend on non-GPL things. Do we have any dependencies on non-GPL tools right no, now no in the no. tool chain? No. no. Perl. There's no dependency on Perl to actually build tool chain. Yeah, there is. There's totally a dependency on Perl. We can't build the tool chain without Perl. Well, Perl is available under the GPL. I mean, if that's your consideration. Yeah. One so the question is, are there any tools? So like, uh, I guess the statement is, uh, Python is not GPL. So it would, be, would it be the first thing that we, the first component of its kind that is depend, that the, a GPL tool, a GNU tool chain would depend upon that's not GPL? Yeah. I don't see that use yeah. of something under the GPL compatible permissive license to be any more problematic than, say, GCC using subversion for version control, which is also under a GPL compatible permissive license. Yeah. So well, it's, a, it's a good question. I think probably the answer is as long as the projects are GPL compatible, then we're happy to work with them and use them in the tools, like SVN, I guess. OK. Um, so we've had, a, a Joseph, just a document. The objections are roughly the same objections that Sousa has had, which is it increases the bootstrap. Uh, there's not quite any consensus about whether or not it's harder to bootstrap Perl or Python. So there is some complexity. And it's, you know, we understand that there's complexity there. Yeah, uh, Jose? How easy is to install Python 3? Because some of us, sometimes we are condemned you know, to work with all distros, like I don't know, Red Hat 6 or even <laughs> older. But, I mean, so know, now the thing is, how easy is to install Python 3 so it's, in an old distro that is based on Python 2? It is too late for you already, because uh, well, RHEL, yeah, RHEL yeah. 6 doesn't even have a new enough compiler to compile glibc anymore. Neither does RHEL 7. Well, yeah, fine. But I can build a GCC with no problem, right? In an old uh, Red Hat. I do it all the time, unfortunately. So is this a so question? So your question is, how easy is it to bootstrap a Python install Yes, in because generally speaking, I don't mind dependencies if it is something that I can download and build and install, you know, like more or less easily, but, you know, decoupled from the, from the distro that I am using yeah. as a development environment. We would have to, I mean, I guess as developers, I'm, I'm asking have, because I have no idea yeah. how easy it is to get a Python 3 tarball and build it, and uh, so I can use it for the only purpose of building glibc in this case. 
Yeah. If you want to build Python 3.7 on an old distribution, yeah. you might need to build a newer OpenSSL first because it does require OpenSSL versions that, for example, a more recent than, say, Ubuntu 14.04 has. I think there is a non-default configure option that you can use to disable the parts of Python 3.7 that depend on OpenSSL. That would mean we couldn't use, say, the hash Lib module, but we probably don't need to use the hashlib module in our scripts in glibc. So Joseph, if we want to dog food this, no, so Jose, if we want to dog food this, we basically, as glibc developers, could commit. So we have we have build many glibcs. It's our script infrastructure to build the entire bootstrap the tool chain and test all the test all the components. I mean, we could commit to dog food and add Python to build many glibcs and and build it so that so no no so so that if we did that, you would you could go in and look at our scripts and see the exact process we did to build it and copy it, right? And we could test build many glibcs on 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 other rels and things like that. And so we'd have a canonical place that shows how you build it and install it and use it for a cross tool chain. Right, but is it possible to install and use Python three without installing it system wide? Well, that's what I we mean, show. We would show you from in the, the development in, environment in the script. you are using. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Right now, build many glibcs is written in Python 3, by the way. <laughs> I know. OK, okay it, I think it requires 3.2 or later, because someone at ARM using one of these old distros added some compatibility for versions older than 3.5, yeah. which is what I first voted for. But we're talking about 3.4, I think, as yeah. the minimum that would be required for building glibc, since that's the oldest Python 3 version yeah. that's not already gone end of line upstream. Yeah. I want to get to Ian's question, because Ian did not get to ask this question, and he's waited patiently. And I, I think the Python 3 situation has gotten to roughly the same consensus we got in Upstream, which is there's an additional difficulty in the bootstrap process. Uh, Jose raised a very good question, which is how expensive is it to, like, how do you add it and use it in a restricted environment like RHEL 6 or something? And then the answer to that is maybe we add it to build many glibcs. So I think we'll stop there, and I'll let, I'll let Ian ask his question. It was not a question so much as a comment. You say you're going to be deprecating more things. And uh, the last thing you deprecated that I noticed was Ustat. And I wanted to point out that it actually caused a problem for building Go distributions because um, Go provides its own set of system call interfaces. And, uh, it, and so I'm talking about GCC Go in particular. GCC Go provides its, I mean, all Go distribution provide their own set of system call interfaces. So since Ustat existed, we provided a syscall.ustat. And that's fine if syscall.ustat stops working. But the problem was that GCC Go stopped building entirely because it now had a reference to Ustat, which no longer existed in new, Libs, new glibcs. And that meant that all old versions of GCC Go no longer build with a new glibc because Ustat no longer exists. And so this is sort of a general problem with deprecating things. It doesn't only break the programs that specifically use those functions. It also breaks any framework that provides that function as part of a general but, but I mean, but by definition, the framework is using that interface, right? Right, yeah. By, so it's, it, or rather, the framework is providing that interface for its own users. So if its own users don't use it, everything's going to be fine. Yeah. But the framework won't build. Yeah. yeah. So I wonder yeah. if you could <laughs> I wonder if you could take this into consideration and when you remove something like you said just replace it with a stub that always returns the notice. So I mean like so the uh, again we come back to oh replace it with a stub you mean. Yeah, like replace just the returns just stub. returns an error. That that would be right, sufficient. Florian, can you uh, extra mic there. Yeah. So uh, that it's kind of a difficult uh, decision because in, in some cases, um, when projects compile with W error, then even adding a deprecation message causes more problems than outright removal because the configure check sees, okay, it's gone. We no longer compile it in. Um, and you get a clean build as a result. But if you add a deprecation message, then you get, um, 
uh, get uh, don't get a warning during configure and the configure check passes, but you get a build error afterwards due to the deprecation message. And I find it hard to believe that, I mean, keeping the interface without a deprecation warning and saying, and just telling in the documentation it will always fail seems to be not really helpful. At that point, we can still maintain the header file, the, the struct definitions, and also uh, we have to keep those. And uh, the only value is that we had now have a stop instead of a real system call. And at that point, we can just stop removing things. And for struct use that, the thing that, well, why we removed it is that the kernel deprecated it, and I think the syscall is gone from new architectures. Yeah, I, so, I'm not questioning removing yeah. it. Yeah, no, um, so we're out of time, but I would like to make a comment. Would you like to have known earlier, right? Was there something that we could have done yeah, earlier? I'd like to have known about three years earlier, roughly. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious, I'm totally serious. No, no, no. If you're talking it's, about it's, depre it's, deprecating it's, things, got to have a long time scale on it. So uh, the problem we've had is we mark things for deprecation, we wait several years, and then we get rid of them, and nobody pays any attention in the long term. I understand that. But what I want to get from you is if we'd known, so for example, if we'd build GCC Go and it failed and it showed for us in some kind of CI infrastructure, for example, like if in build many glibcs we had an extra step in which we built every language runtime, then we would have gone, oh, well, but that change broke GCC Go, sh we should go talk to Ian and say, hey, look, the two things aren't working anymore. Can we get your feedback on the change that we made? I think probably would have been a better first step. Yeah, that so would be great. So we're here. Is there any reason we don't build all the languages? Is it the dependencies? Because the main point of build many GMCs is to test your <laughs> But this is an, it's an, in yeah. 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 Okay. So. But we could add an option to it, say, to build all languages and live sanitize and so on. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. Expect yeah. This will quite often break the things that are basically not Ulysses full. So then what we want is we want Go people and live sanitize people and so on to run their own bots using this option and to watch them and to fix those things like live sanitizer and live Go. Yeah. So. I think that we're making positive forward steps to getting to the point where we'll notice when things break, or we'll be talking to you to help us run those scripts to make sure that we're all on the same page when something breaks, when we put out a release or then we're doing stuff. And you're not the first person to be impacted by this. The sanitizers are the very first people for which stuff breaks, and then we're having discussions with them, and part of these build scripts is that. But um, I thank everybody for coming. We need to get out of the room because the university is kicking us out. And thank you very much.